Hey up friends, how's it going? It's Matt, you listen to the Looking Sideways podcast, the show where I try and uncover the most fascinating stories in action sports and other related endeavours. Thanks for listening to this one and I do hope you enjoy it. Had a couple of weeks off actually, as you might have noticed if you're a particular keno. Might go into that at housekeeping corner at the end. But in the meantime, I'm back with a new episode, so fret not. And it's another occasion when that uh, very useful and other related endeavours caveat that I built into the tagline is really coming into its own. That's because my guest this week is motorcycling trials legend, Dougie Lampkin. Dougie has, believe it or not, been a much requested guest on the show, one of those proper dark horse guests. But that's because when people know about him, they know, they know how impressive he is. He's one of those legendary figures who've dominated his sport to such an extent that he's crossed over into that mythical realm where he basically symbolises the entire affair in the eyes of the mainstream and the uninitiated. And when you look at the numbers, it really isn't difficult to see why. Dougie, who, as we will hear, hails from the first family of British motorcycle trials riding, first arrived on the scene officially 25 years ago when he won his first Scottish six-day trials and trial GP events. And he went on to have an era-defining career, and that is not overstating it, which saw him win seven consecutive world titles and dominate the sport to such an unparalleled degree that he's pretty much considered to be the greatest trials rider of all time. Naturally, we discussed this, and uh, it was absolutely fascinating hearing Dougie dissect his mindset during this um, unprecedented purple patch of success. Now, after this, he retired from competing in the trial GP events, but he continued competing in Scottish six Dale trials and he continued his association with long-term sponsor Red Bull. He is the brand's longest serving UK athlete, which gives you an idea of the status that Dougie enjoys. And that's seen him undertake one of the maddest and most high profile Red Bull stunts of recent years, which was his mission to wheelie around the Isle of Man TT course, which we also discussed at length in trademark dry as a bone Dougie fashion. And because as I discovered, as well as being a true champion, somebody who's reshaped his sport in his own image, Dougie Lampkin is also very, very funny and very good company. It's one of the reasons why he's so loved and highly regarded by trials fans and anybody else who knows about him really. And there's another reason for Dougie's popularity, his pitiless honesty regarding the lows that have come with those world-beating highs. There are the competitive lows, of course, including that inevitable moment when the crown slipped and the winning streak ended. There's also the personal lows, notably the loss of his beloved father, Martin, father, friend, mentor and partner throughout his incredible career. It's a loss Dougie is still clearly feeling very keenly and he speaks very movingly about the experience and how it's caused him to reevaluate his own life. So yeah, a brilliant conversation this one. I mean, I know it works. The podcast drops in the app, you scan the title, you make a snap decision whether to listen. If you've not heard of him, you might listen to the intro before deciding whether to listen anymore. Well, as I've mentioned before in this situation, I really, really implore you to stick with this one and check it out if you're not familiar with Dougie's world. It's just a brilliant investigation into the mind of an absolute winner and a look at how somebody who's experienced the greatest highs their sport has to offer copes when the wheel turns and he's got to face the negatives that will inevitably follow. Very much enjoyed meeting Dougie, as I think you're going to be able to tell, and I hope you enjoy this conversation between the two of us, the two lives of Dougie Lampkin. Enjoy. How are you doing, Dougie? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah. How's today treating you? Not too bad. Sun's out. Yeah. Down south in the big smoke, you see. Yeah. Brought my jacket and my jumper. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely roasting. Yeah. Classic northern moves. Yeah. Back home tonight. Can't wait already. I was going to say, how often do you get down here then? Ooh, try and avoid the place, to be honest. Yeah. Some people love it, but mm, yeah. I'm a country boy. Necessary for you to come down here Necessary. and do the rounds. Jammed in. I've got so much stuff jammed in today, like we need yeah. 36 hours in today, but yeah. yeah, we'll be back last train. Well, you carved out a couple of hours for me, which I appreciate. No problem at all. Yeah. Um, and what else you got on? Um, I'm off to see a couple of sponsors. Yeah. Got a couple of new projects. We have a meeting with Red Bull as well uh, here in the office. So I'm going to 
fire a few ideas around. Oh yeah, anything you can, mm. any anything you kind of no, not new, really. new projects. Not really. I've got to wreck here uh, another video in India. Right. Um, so I'm going there and to look at that beginning of September. So I'll do that either at the end of the year or in January, February. Right. But that's an interesting location. So I'm not giving too much away on yeah. that. Yeah. Is that kind of a nice position to be in now you can kind of pick these little little ideas and projects yeah absolutely and And that is you know that's all down to red bull really yeah and when i was just sort of finishing in the in the world championship been with them a long time i'm in the 20th year now so yeah they offer these sort of opportunities you come up with ideas and and plans to ride in odd and obscure places and different locations yeah and, and different terrains as much as anything you know i rode in the the snow and ice in the north of finland yeah there's a roller coaster uh, video in yeah well. roller coaster video in italy yeah. uh, maldives yeah on, on, a, on a little island in the maldives which was quite repetitive because there wasn't a lot to go at as you can imagine yeah right um yeah. sri lanka india in goa oh yeah Kuwait, the whole lot. And how do you come up with them ideas? Do, do, do you just kind of look at, is it quite a question like getting the map out and thinking? No, or? not really. Um, because I'm a bit travelled out, to be honest, because yeah. I'm still doing so much and going yeah. to the World Championships with, you know, the Vertigo team and a manager and all and all that going on. Yeah. But um, I still just love riding my bike. Yeah. Um, so it's a good opportunity. To, great opportunity, yeah. yeah. I don't want to go practising in the middle of nowhere on my own. Yeah. I'd just rather you know go to a, an amazing location and do a nice video it doesn't need to be massively extreme it doesn't just needs to be just what i think's cool and yeah. nice you know a bit of a journey across some amazing terrain on on a motorbike which people don't generally know much of you know trials is a bit of a uh, a smaller sport you yeah. know if you're a bit older you'll remember kickstart oh, yeah. back in the day on everyone, bbc everyone listen to it well um, everyone listen to this but the new kids on the block they we'll don't know it. that you see yeah um so yeah we're everyone we're remembers one of the those, theme tune don't they does, does everyone, does everyone you know. go around like whistling the theme tune yeah you? it's amazing and and you know sort of celebrities and stuff like that when you meet when i've met people and they throw what do you and yeah yeah trials and they just start kickstart. doing kickstart <laughs> and things like that yeah, yeah. no it's it's just one of those programs. I think it's still the most watched kids TV program on um, on TV. I think it was because as well back in the, them days, obviously there was you know it's the classic like three or four channels, not a lot on. No you know, YouTube. Exactly. No Netflix. No. And no mobile phones. God, can you imagine it? It was great. I know. Yeah. I miss I miss them days. I do sometimes. Yeah. I must admit. Yeah, especially with well, let's not go down that road. It's not like right. Pair of old farts, aren't we? Um, right. Okay. So it's a good opportunity just to. Well, you know, you've earned the right, aren't you, to like basically do these projects, ride your bike in nice places. Like, so you, it's kind of a nice way to look at it like that, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, you move on from the competitive side. You know, you get older, they get younger. As people yeah. start beating you. You feel like you're making the numbers up. So you know, the opportunity that I've had that started off with Red Bull for sure. Yeah. Um, is still carrying on, and I still love it. Yeah. So one of the things we were just chatting about before i started recording is it's 25 years since i guess what you have described as kind of like the you know the start of your you, you know when you when you arrived on the world stage as it were first scottish six day first trial grand prix i was kind of surprised that you didn't put 97 and the, the world title as that milestone yeah do you know what i mean yeah like, no no i can understand that so because well, because obviously 97 you've got this the run the start of the run of seven but you've chosen this specific period of, of like, you know, the, the first major victories, if you yeah, like. Yeah. So explain the significance of that then. Yeah, it's a tricky one, really. I mean, you know, I was 18 in uh, in 94. Um, the year before, in 97, uh, in 93, I won the European Trials Championship. And off the back of that, I signed a, a two-year deal with a factory, with the Beta factory. Right. Um, to ride their bikes. So that was quite a big thing. You know, it was an early age to, to be sort of signed into factory deals then for yeah. sure. And, and I suppose it probably still is now. Um, my name definitely helped that. You know, my family's had a lot yeah. um, to do with motorsports forever. Yeah, so, which um, would be good to chat about as well. Absolutely, I'm sure, I'm yeah. Sure so will. I definitely had a bit of a head start on yeah. that. You know, there's no question. I'm not running away from that fact at all. Yeah. Um, had, you, had you thought, like how serious up until that point were you about it as a career because obviously like you say you've got generations of your family obviously it's in your blood yeah you know probably the most fa- you know like it, everyone knows that that part of the story yeah and you've also talked about 
the fact that it was in your life, but it won't ram, ram down your throat, was it? Absolutely. You know, it was something that they they kind of let you choose really, right? So presumably as you were growing up, you know, you started riding and then it, you realized it was something that you, that you loved and that you wanted to do. So at what point did you, is that the significance of this? This is when you kind of started to think actually, yeah, I can, I can do this. Like I can be yeah, on a level. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, we went to the first round of the European Championship in 93 just to see where the level was, see yeah. if I was good enough. Right. I'd never ridden abroad before. And you didn't, you didn't know? We didn't know. I was six in the first trial and my dad said yeah. we better go to the second round and I won the second round. Right. All of a sudden, I won the championship. I had a deal. We were rolling into 94. I was going to Spain to practice, you know, in the different conditions, a lot drier, everything a lot bigger. Yeah. Spent a lot of time training, put a hell of a lot of effort in, you know, like if you're going to have a go, make sure you have a really good go. I was yeah, under yeah. no illusion that it was going to come to me on a plate. I knew that it was about effort equals reward. I've always known that from a, from a very early age. And... Uh, yeah, the Scottish Six Days, early May, um, that was like my biggest event. I'd, I'd obviously, I'd passed my test, I could ride on the road. Yeah. Um, I've been going to that event since I was six weeks old, following my dad, following my right. uh, my cousin John, yeah. following his riders when he became an importer after that. It, you know, I've never missed it all my life. It's as simple as that. How, uh, long, have, how long have your family had an association with those events? Oh, well, I couldn't bit, bit of a tangent, but like, I'm interested. Oh, it'll be early 60s. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Could even be a bit earlier than that. Could right. even be fifties. So and like put me on the spot there. I don't know. That's an interesting one. Is that there's, though? There's been a Lampkin presence at that event. Yeah, pretty much every year. Since every then. year. Yeah. Right. So I mean, it is. I've already used that expression, but in the blood isn't too strong, is it? No. Really? No, absolutely. And um, you, and your dad and your uncles and your granddad, right? Were, cousin, were all, uncles, and and my dad. Yeah. And my cousins. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so so they were all like massively successful as well right yeah they 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 all won it except my cousin john right which we do remind him about now and again <laughs> um, nice one <laughs> uh, but yeah no he's the one who sort of you know he was taking me a lot in my early years as my dad took him in his, his early years yeah, it was like yeah. you know the roles reversed really there right um but yeah it sort of came around to the scottish six days time i'd obviously ridden the year before and i was six which sort of surprised a few people just become european champions to put a lot of effort in end up winning the Scottish Six Days. Right. And and that was massive. Yeah. I think it's difficult to say, did you expect to win it? <laughs> Probably not. But, right, really? So but, you, you didn't go into it thinking like... This is mine. You know, like... Uh, um, no, absolutely not. Right. It's a funny event. It, it's one of those that you sort of have to learn a little bit. People say that about circuits like the Isle of Man TT. You know, yeah. It takes you a few years to Got learn Got to get the experience. It. Yeah, riding for six days. You know, it's about 100 miles a day. There's a lot to it. It sort of drains you a little bit. Yeah. And I didn't win easily, but I had a decent advantage and took the win. And I think that kick-started the season, really. Right. I okay. was having a good season in, in the Worlds um, around about the top... 10 um most of the time and then i finished six at the end did i finish six yeah finished six at the end right it's a long time to think back good, then. good memory though um uh, well i hope i'm right yeah, somebody'll yeah. be writing in <laughs> somebody'll be writing in if it wasn't six i do Someone apologize like but i Stu, think it was Stu, six Stu brass will be like that that's not Stu brass. <laughs> there's a name that's an eight road kickstart he, yeah. he'll, he'll be like that he'll, he'll be yeah, sitting up yeah, he'll yeah. be down in Chichester never seen him since he'll be, he'll be down in Chichester sitting up at that I know I'm going to call around <laughs> and he can make me a brew um, but, right okay but six yeah I was in six yeah and then we had the home round um, near Preston at a place called Horton Tower yeah I remember doing an interview before it and they were saying, you are one of the strong hopes for the win here. And I was thinking, I am absolutely not. But I was trying to bluff it into right. a, yeah, 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 I've got a good chance of winning here. I'm, thinking, so no, nope, you haven't. Was that the name then? The expectation? Um, do you think? I think so. When it was home race and it was one of my sponsors that won a... Good story. Yeah, it was a tyre sponsor at the time. And they yeah. was one of the sponsors of the event. And they did a press day. And it, I was all blown up that, you know... There's a, here's the British lads, these are the lads that yeah, yeah. win it. And I was one of them. And I right. was like, well, there ain't a chance of me winning this. But, you know, as I've always given 110%, I did do during that day. Um, something definitely happened. The, definitely the stars all aligned that one. If, you know, if there'd have been a, if there'd been a massive pool of water, I could have walked across that as well because <laughs> I could just about do anything I wanted to do that day. Everything right. I pinged off, everything I hit, it always went the right way. Right. And it was just one of them days. Was that, was that something you'd experienced before, like feeling that? Not really, not really, especially at that, not, at that level or not, maybe not that something that springs to mind, I would say. And 
yeah, I didn't really know what position I was in because I was seeded obviously a bit earlier then. So I was setting off the best lad set off at the back and I was like round about 15 seeded then. So I was, right. I was quite a bit earlier than the others. Maybe that helped a little bit on the day. You yeah. Know, I don't know, but yeah, I, it certainly turned a few heads when I did win, right. including my own. And you said that gave you confidence going into the rest of the season. Yeah, we had a couple more rounds at the end of that season. Um, and and I think that's just sort of given me another little kick like, oh, wow, if you won one, you know, your dream of becoming world champion could actually come true. So right. I didn't have any time off in, this, in the off season. I just was flat out, was practicing like mad. Yeah. Um, I loved riding the bike, hated going to the gym, even started trying to go to the gym a little bit. And right. Wasn't my favorite place. Right. Um, we're lucky in our sport that you just need to be in in the hills in Yorkshire and we had a lot of places to ride even more back then than now yep. and I just went out on my bike as much as I could um, everyone knew where I was going parents knew where I was going it was just a case of getting on and riding and yeah. and getting the hours in right. and yeah and then rolled into 95 and it was even better right. so, so won the Scottish again and it, it just started going in the right direction and as I could curve. see it was going in the right direction yeah. I just pushed harder yeah so you, you said that the dream of being world champion so presumably that had been that had been there you'd been thinking like from when you were a kid presumably yeah for sure i mean everybody dreams don't they you know people some people want to be a policeman or fireman or a doctor or or you know a rally car driver or yeah. formula one driver or yeah, yeah we all had them dreams and mine was to ride a motorbike and i'm one of the definitely the minority that managed to just sort of make that happen yeah um but like I said, it was from a ridiculous amount of of work and effort. Sacrifice is a bit of an odd word to use for it because... Because yeah, you loved it. I absolutely loved it, yeah. I didn't spend three or four weekends a month um, going to the nightclub with all my friends because I'd either be travelling or I'd be coming back from events or yeah. training or something, but can't call it a sacrifice, really. I was, yeah. I was just living the dream. And where did this work ethic that you're talking about come from is that presumably like pretty big part of your upbringing to to kind of yeah i think so we were we were pretty you. grounded really i mean we definitely didn't miss out on anything you know we we're fortunate to have you know all the bikes that we needed and all the kit that we needed um i was pretty handy at football um back in the day I used to play for silsden white star oh yeah what was your position they were massive <laughs> just about to go into premiership that's a pretty strong name according to Silsden my dad white according star. to my dad i was left back in the changing room <laughs> but, but basically i didn't really have a position because i didn't really understand any of that right but i think the only reason why i was in is i had a horrible pair of goaler football boots that my dad had bought me they didn't even fit and for some reason Everyone, could, again everyone's gonna be like go i had the goalers yeah yeah black white stripe yeah but i could score from corners and i think right. that is purely the only reason why i was on the pitch right and our pitch was on a hell of an angle and i could run like hell for ages yeah, so yeah. when it ball were rolling down wrong side at hill yeah i could run after it and get it back in yeah i don't yeah. think it was for my footballing talent <laughs> <laughs> but golf was massive as well right yeah up. i did play a lot of golf um with my friends spent the summer holidays lived at the golf club in silsden I think when I got to about 12, I was riding a lot of bikes and a lot of golf and dad was like, you're going to have to choose one or the other right. because you're doing both flat out. You're not doing anything else. What do you want to do? And from that moment then, I've not played golf at all. Right. Really? Um, I bet I've played oh, half a dozen times. Right. Since then, it just stopped. And was that, the, was that really the only kind of over nudge that your dad gave you where he was a bit like, you might want to decide? Because yeah, it path, sounds like he was pretty mm, hands off. With yeah, the, it, was, it was, which was absolutely brilliant. I mean, people would expect it to be the opposite. You know, he was desperate for me to follow in his footsteps, but it really wasn't at all. Right. Um, you know, he was hugely successful in what he did. And, but when he stopped riding, he stopped riding. Yeah. He didn't ride for a bit of fun. He didn't do anything. He just got back on, did normal things. You know, he owned a pub, he owned a cafe, he owned right. a news agents. It wasn't anything to do with bikes, which people would expect. Um, so I never had any of that pressure. Right. And why, that's interesting. So once he gave up, he, he really did just leave it. Yeah, he just walked away. And did, did he ever talk to you about why? Like, um, not, not really too much. <laughs> I mean, he, he rode for a company called Bull Taco most of his life. They were in yeah. um, Catalonia in Spain. 
um, around Barcelona area. He did feel like part of their family. Um, we're still in contact with some members of that of that family. It was in the time when the Franco was in charge back yeah. in Spain and they needed to lose some staff because he was allowing people to import stuff in which hadn't previously happened. Right. Know, so other manufacturers were coming in. And yeah, they, they went bust and they owed my dad quite a fair bit of money and he had to like hit reality, you know. Right. He, had, he had a young son, uh, myself, and uh, yeah, he had to get back into the real world and yeah. um, he bought a pub. Right. And it was a hugely successful pub. My mum worked fingers to the bone and he had to sell it before, you know, before they both keeled over, basically. Right, you right. Know, it was quite competitive that it had to be the best pub around. Yeah. There's uh, that work ethic. <laughs> that, that work ethic <laughs> popping back in. Yeah. yeah. So I've got a bit of that as well in me. Right. Well, that, that's why I asked the question, really, because it sounds to me that you're not somebody that could give up riding your bike, like, no matter what happened, really. Uh, no, and that's a massive difference from yeah, there. That's, that's why I'm still I'm... doing what I'm doing now. I still love riding my bike. You know, I'm, I ride, oh, God knows how many days a week. I don't do the training, nothing yeah. like what I did. I love to go ride with the kids and what have you and just have fun or, you know, with some family members or friends. You know, that's absolutely great. The competitive side has definitely sort of drifted off now, apart from a few times a year where I do the classic events as the Scottish Six Days. Yeah. And, and the Scott trial a bit later on in the year in England. A few were broad, but it's right. mainly shows and, and yeah. Red Bull stuff and the development and the testing for the for the factory, for the Vertigo factory I ride for now. And that's that's what I love doing. I've always loved that development side and sort of helping the younger riders in the team and stuff like that. And yeah. Not always giving them the best advice, but <laughs> at least my advice anyway, whether they can take it or leave it, sometimes they do. But yeah. that's, you know just trying to pass that on it's great yeah well and then obviously dad had your career and it sounds like he <clears throat> was a massive backer of you throughout that i mean you know yeah, kind of under, underselling it really a little bit because yeah. he, you know he was like your main your main source supporter and champion wasn't he really when like the glory is like so, oh, you know, for sure we, we mentioned sure. like 97 was your first world title seven in a row you got it's like massive period of dominance yeah basically and he was right with you the whole time. So what did what did that support give you? Yeah, I mean it's we're a, we're a unique sport really, where we're not we're not a speed sport trials. You know, we ride over obstacles through what we call sections, and you get penalised for putting your feet down and and falling off. Um, but at that, we have a minder, what we call a minder. Yeah. Um, and they're there to sort of catch you or the bike in case of problems. So you're always riding round with that. Um, that person and that yeah. person always happened to be my dad right um, so we he liked to call it that we had a father and son relationship outside the thing but I used to bollock him that much during <laughs> the events that he used to take it all <laughs> and then when we got to the end of the event I would get a monster bollocking because apparently we'd just turned back into father and son once right. we finished the event but he used to take it all and then I'd get it in the neck when we finished but right. yeah you know we had an absolutely amazing relationship and like I said with his experiences and my family's experiences certainly made you know a, a big difference to my career you know i missed quite a few pitfalls that I would have definitely stepped into um without that advice and that experience that i got that i got from him and did they know when to to dish that out um yeah i would say so i didn't i wouldn't say i really got you know told off let's say yeah. or things like that i was quite quickly you know sort of up to speed and i knew what it took really but I think there was all them little comments that when you think back now, you know, trying to think of them, um, you recognise. Yeah, it's in quite the a support network, that, isn't it? Yeah, in the off season, I was getting a bit carried away going out with my friends right. and, you know, spending, yeah. you know, too many nights in the disco and yeah, stuff yeah. like that, trying yeah. to be with the cool kids and yeah. I just get, you just did, get, you just get dragged back into line a little bit of, yeah. whoa, you've got like massive event in two weeks yeah. and you're up till three o'clock in the morning. You're not going training for three days because you're still rough. Um, right bike out yeah you're stopping in just them little bits steering I'll, I'll, you in the, steering me in that's the right, exactly it in yeah. the right direction For rather sure. than basically cracking the whip yes yeah yeah so when you look at this kind of period of dominance I mean it's, it's a difficult question I imagine but what stands out because it's a big it's a long run in it yeah I think the first one's always going to stand out because like I said before, you know, you dream of being whatever when you're a kid, all sorts of weird and wonderful things. I just wanted to be a world champion and I managed to achieve that, you know, that sort of kid's dream, which is like a minority. I absolutely um, 
unbelievable. I was thrilled to bits. Took, yeah. took a few weeks to see, sink in, that is for sure. For all of us, you know, the family was absolutely elated, obviously, and, uh, and, and I personally was. And then you're like, you had a bit of a taste for it, so all of a sudden you think, oh, I quite like that win. I might have another go at that if I can. Yeah. Is that something uh, you've always had in you? That, that, like, yeah, pretty, unfortunately. Pretty fierce will to win. Yes. I'm an absolute miserable bugger when I lose. Yeah. I moan. I, I mean, whinge. I'm, I sulk. I imagine you need that if you're going to try and win seven world titles. <laughs> I think the, so, on yeah. Shot, really. I think so, yeah. But if you jump forward, that's a problem now. Right. Because like uh, I had 99 GP wins, yeah. 99 world trial wins. And everybody says, well, imagine if it, you know, 100, I bet you'd have loved that. Yeah. Well, couldn't have cared less really because it'd have had to have been 101. If it were 101, it had to be 102. Yeah. And that's that's the problem really. Right. From a professional side, not but, satisfied at all. And does that carry over into your, your personal life as well? Uh, fortunately, not at all. Right. Um, yeah, I've been um, with my wife. See, I'm trying to think now of the years, so hopefully she's not listening to this. But I'll have to fast forward <laughs> this say, bit, I can, so I can, I can, I can trim yeah, this You'll bit. have to trim this bit this a little bit. bit. Yeah. yeah, no, I've been um, with my wife since um, 1998. Right. And, yeah, we've got a great family, um, two boys. And fortunately, I can completely switch off. Right. So when it gets five or six o'clock, um, I'm at home whenever I'm at home. Yeah. Um, in the house, you'd have no idea what I did. You don't. You if don't feel was, the if heat through to... the heat, key all came in. Yeah. I wouldn't, wouldn't have a clue. Yeah. There's no pictures. There's no trials bikes. There's no memorabilia. There's no it's... trophies lying around. No. Right. Then a single trophy in our house. Is that a perp? Do you do that on purpose? Um, I've done that ever since I owned my first house in the right. Isle of Man. What? what um, back what, in '97. What? Why did you do that? Um. I think I do like to just disconnect from it. I think you have to do. Right. Because um, the press, like, because it's so intense. I would when say you're so. I would say so, yeah. But also, I felt like, I didn't feel like I was missing out on things, but also I wanted a bit of real world as well. Right. And that was the real world, not in this bubble of motorcycling of, you know, yeah. what's happening next. I wanted to, you know, lay out on the sofa and, and get a takeaway and watch a bit of telly and not look at a load of trophies on the thing or a or a framed jersey of some other rider on the walls. Yeah. And not that um, I'm, I'm laughing at no, anybody I that's got that. I understand. From my side, I, I was, you didn't need it. I was I, watching a load of rubbish on TV. That's why I'm interested though. Eating it, a load of rubbish. It seems quite a controlled thing to just, to say, do you know what? I'm going to draw a line here. I'm not going to have it in, in the house basically yeah. because yeah. I need to protect this, this environment. This is my private you side. Know what I mean? Yeah. You know what and, and, and from that side, I've never done, well, actually, to tell a lie, I did do it once in the Isle of Man and absolutely hated it. I've never done it again. I've never done interviews at home. Right. Never had photos done at home. You know, the old faithful when you stood in front of the sofa with your chest you, out. You've not you been know. On okay, in okay. Definitely not going in okay. Um, I can't see it, to be honest. Yeah, no, never. And wife thinks I'm a bit odd for that. Right. But it's always been like that since before <coughs> I met my wife and... Yeah, it is a bit odd. Well, I, I don't think it's is, odd. It's I, just, I just think it, it is different from the norm. Let's say I don't think it's odd. It's it just, just sounds like you're somebody that understands really intimately like what what works for him psychologically and, and emotionally, and and that you you understand where to have the control in your life because you yeah. you know we've we've already talked <clears throat> a bit about control in your competitive life, the, and and now you're talking about like you know it's it's just it's focused and, and, and it seems like it, it adds to what probably helped you achieve what you achieved. Yeah, I think so because it, to be honest, it is something that was already installed before I started winning anything. Yeah. You know, it's not, I don't have trophies in my house because my wife don't like them. Actually, yeah. before I even met my wife, I didn't have trophies didn't in do my it. house. It's just, that's how I've been. I think the only bit where I have a bit of a crossover is and it happened used to happen a lot more. Obviously, now I ride less. But this year, I lost the the Scotty Six Days trial in the beginning of May yeah. for the first time <clears> in seven, eight years. Right. And for three days afterwards, I was completely sulking. Going to say how'd that feel? Absolute bloody nightmare, <laughs> you know. And it's weird because there was my manager was there, Jake was there, my cousin John the owner of the current bike that I use now, and they were saying, "Oh, well done, you know, you've had a great ride second. And, yeah, and I just couldn't get my head I would just lift like, it up, I would just lift it up going what are you talking about yeah and they were like you're 43 yeah 
you've just like you know one of the biggest events that year you've just finished second yeah you haven't won it but you must be delighted and i'm looking up like are you i think someone's having a laugh here right and they just can't get the head around it right still now yeah and then you know a few days later and i'm at home you know moping about and nicola my wife's just going you, you, you can't still be like this but i am right and i probably always will be i'm i'm just yeah second was amazing but it's just not enough so how do you replace that um i don't think you can replace that i think that's why there's two two duggies yeah like this that you've had to basically there's this douglas lampkin fella who's this private man very you know loves his own time and does all this and then you've got this dougie lampkin mba who's yeah it was this professional man who unfortunately is absolutely delighted of everything he's achieved but yeah. just wishes he had that one more and so have you had to kind of I'm not going to say create these two personalities that's like massively overdoing it but do you know what I mean is that is that a way you've learned to kind of compartmentalise um, this I, I think it's just more naturally happened that right. way really it's not something I've I don't think I'm sort of clever enough to sort of be yeah. able to manufacture something a bit special yeah, yeah. like that but I you've recognised that it they helps they recognise that yeah. hang on a minute you know I do yeah. realise that three days after Scottish Six Days I do need to stop sulking yeah you know you know, life goes on you're back home now that's yeah. gone there's nothing you can do about it yeah you give it everything but still now like now it's been brought up on my way home tonight I will think about during that event what could have been better what could have been different really could I have done more training yeah and that'll be a bloody nightmare for this year because I'll definitely start training a few weeks earlier thinking that might be the difference yeah okay, just how i analyze things all the time and my brain's ticking away and yeah you'll try and look you'll try and find a positive you'll yeah try and think, i try and right. find something that might make the difference and that'll yeah. start the ball rolling again how long does that take before uh, you can start stop dwelling on the the sort of negative feelings i've, then. I've stopped dwelling on it now really i mean it yeah. was in may if, but you know what i mean though like yeah cause but I, cause if I, things bring it up like yeah. this has brought it up i've not thought about it for a week or two <laughs> thanks very much Aren't you gonna it's be, only in july we're you, thinking about bloody scottish again already <laughs> got a few things to do before I'll tell you what, i'm gonna check the results next year i'm <laughs> gonna be like there we go there we go we'll have another interview next year and yeah, we can just yeah. see we can just overlap <laughs> it and see what went on and it'll just be the same answer like right come on like what, what what was the difference this year but it is interesting because you know you won the seven in a row and then you and then you lost obviously and if you're talking about this very fierce will to win and dislike of losing let's put it that way and then you lose in in, in that way and and it's kind of symbolic of your career taking a turn a yeah. different term i mean that's that's a big deal right so how do you how do you cope with that um well, I don't think there's any way that you can prepare for losing after you've been so... Um, well, I've been on the top for seven years, like yeah. I say. There's, and totally I, dominant. And I was so confident in what I was doing that no one was ever beating me. But yeah. when I did win my last did you, title, it was down to the last race. But just a quick one. So you, yeah. felt, you felt like that in the, during those seven years? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I knew that if I did, with how I trained and how I worked and, and, and the team around me that I'd created, I knew that if I did my job, it didn't matter what the others did. And, right. And I never really stopped thinking that right um just unfortunately my teammate were thinking exactly the same thing yeah pretty watching um, you um yeah yeah we've been teammates for quite a few years he'd been second a couple of years from we were both riding for honda at the time i'd won at the final round the year that i'd won i had a couple of points advantage but it, it wasn't a who wins wins but it was pretty close to that so i knew we'd got closer um i certainly didn't let up yeah but he certainly just found another gear right and you know from the off he started making a little bit of a lead and then middle of the season i was like crawling him in and then he had another couple of wins and um we had one race after the uh, like summer break remember europe goes on holiday for august yeah so yeah it's like yeah get your work done now get your work done now yeah and i wasn't miles behind but we needed a we need a little bit of something to happen um, during summer break like fall off his push bike or something <laughs> like that unfortunately it didn't happen the Chris Room. yeah we yeah. needed a bit of that happening yeah. and um, yeah I can remember riding around that event it was a double day I absolutely cruised the event right I won both days by miles but yeah I knew it was sliding away right and that was horrendous right um, he, he played it he played it 
cool as a cucumber. He right. set off. He got going in case there were any issues. So he had a bit of time to fix his stuff if anything went wrong. He did just what he had to do to take the title. Yeah. He took it off me and uh, and I sulked. Right. No, how, yeah. How long did that last? <laughs> it lasted a fair while, I think. <laughs> but I'm still sulking now, so yeah, it has yeah. been a long time. Yeah. Be on the train later. But yeah, that, that moment comes. It comes yeah. to everybody. Well, you know, even people that have accomplished as much... Well... In fact, let me rephrase that, especially, I imagine, people that have accomplished as much as you have because that is a long time to be at the top. Yeah. And if you're as used to it and as confident as you, it sounds like you were, you know, you're saying like, oh, well, I just felt like I would, <coughs> if I turned up and did my thing, then I'd win. Yeah. So. Sounds cocky as hell, does that, doesn't it? Well, it sounds like a, like I say, controlled. This is the thing. Control that, sounds better than cocky. I like that. That's not cocky, everybody. It just sounds cocky, but it's not cocky. You know what I mean, though. You know what I mean. Like it, it, it's, it. Mu- well, again, let's put it another way. It must be something that, and I often think this. Like, I think a lot of people that play amateur sport, yeah, like, occasionally they'll have a moment where they do something that comes out of nowhere, and they're like, "Oh, why that? How'd that happen?" You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think the difference I've always thought with professional athletes is that they can kind of like create those moments, yeah, like make the difference at, when they need to, yeah, and and they true. can sustain it, yeah competitively and that's what it sounds like was going on with you you know you just knew you could do it and i think that's a bit different than being yeah i'm, I'm sure you weren't going around like you know flipping everyone off you like being no. like it's different no, absolutely it's different not. like it's it's just an it sounds like it's a like a just a, a confidence in recognizing your own ability and and that is so when that suddenly starts to go that must be hard absolutely i mean you know, for anybody who's listening now, if you think back seven years, what you were doing seven years, and then think time. about all that time in yeah. between, I, without putting my massive head on, I I had a few years in the middle of that three or four years where I was losing like three or four times a year yeah. in the World Championship. And that was sometimes because bike had had a failure or I'd hurt myself or, you know, when I was doing interviews post uh, before the race, they were saying, you know, who do you think is going to get close today? It wasn't like, how do you feel? <laughs> it was like, <laughs> yeah. we were already doing the podium speech after, and we were the day before the event, you know, in the, in the press conference and stuff. And it was, looking back, it was really odd. But at the time, I was just in this little bubble, right. just doing my thing. And yeah. and there is things now what I think about thinking, oh, you sounded a bit of a cocky bugger there. Or no, no, that were right. Yeah, but there is some sort of odd moments where you're like, yeah, I didn't really take any notice of anybody else. I just right. got on and did my thing. You know, I was riding for Honda. I was in a great team. I had all sorts of sponsors, sponsored by Red Bull. I had all the, the, the brands that I wanted, you know. I was, oh yeah, I had clothing sponsor. I had all sorts of stuff going on. And, yeah. and I was absolutely living the dream, working what I considered to be a 100%, but, you know, there's, there's always space for a little bit more. You're never yep. actually on a 100%. You think you are, but yep. you're never actually there, no matter who or what you're doing. And, uh, yeah, when that moment comes where somebody just turns off the tap and you're not the, the number one anymore and you look down on, on your race suit and it says number two, that just takes a bit of a pill to swallow, is that? Yeah, right. I mean, I don't know if you watched the tennis the other day, but... Federer and, and Djokovic even even that I mean like you know that level and he's going through it obviously yeah. same thing like it's the realise that that's what was kind of amazing about that match really like you could see it it's like it was like no one deserved to lose really yeah, but, but somebody did, has to but do. Federer did lose and it's yeah. like actually now I'm number two yeah. you know like and that's and it's a unique thing that obviously only a handful of people have to experience in life and that's why it's so interesting I think for kind of mere mortals because it it is it must be really really challenging and it must it must kind of strike at the way you see yourself sometimes yeah yeah it was it's certainly a certainly an odd time um yeah and i'm I'm like trying to think back about you know certain points after i'd finished and i can't really picture any moments like for the next few weeks afterwards right and i'm not sure if i've erased them or but I can't sort of like, I remember we were in Switzerland, that way where the last round was. I remember I flew home and I can't tell you a thing that I did for the next two or three weeks. Right. Maybe that's because I've blanked it yeah. or I was just a miserable bugger and I don't want to think about it. But normally I can sort of picture what happened when and where and what you did and all that. But in this case, 
I've got no idea what I did after that event. Right. I just know that I will have been an absolute pain in the ass to everybody who came near. <laughs> <laughs> just that. Just that. Yeah. So that's probably what I did do. Yeah, yeah. No wonder you blanked it. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so what what do you miss about that period? Um that you know, this 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 from bullet, the competitive side feeling. I don't miss the training. That breaks you. Yeah. That training job's just a it's it's ridiculous to say because you're a bloke who's sort of started off a hobby of being a, a motorcycle rider, been a trials rider, absolutely living the dream. And then you get to a stage where I was losing. I didn't really feel like I was making the numbers up, but with trials, you can ride every day of the week because you don't need a circuit, you don't need marshals, various yeah. things like that. And all of a sudden, you don't want to ride on Monday afternoon. And that's a bit odd. Right. For to start off with. And then you wake up on Tuesday morning and you don't want to ride again. Right. So you're like, ooh, ooh, this is odd. I've not been on my bike for a couple of days. Then you get to Wednesday morning and you think, I'm going to have to go on my bike today because I didn't ride for the last two days. But actually, you're not bothered. Yeah. And that's the bit. That's when everyone asks me, you know, when did you know you wanted to retire? Well, oh, that was it. That, that was what, that's what yeah, told Yeah, it's you. nothing to do with the competitive side, yeah. you know, because... I think, you know, I've, I've mentioned before that com that competitive side, my favourite part of it was in the morning of the event. From the moment you wake up to the moment you set off, the bit that everybody hates, you know, that I couldn't eat anything because my stomach was turning over or I was so nervous or, you know, I didn't want to be, I just needed to get going. Well, that was the bit that I absolutely loved and the the bit that I can't find any substitute for that that is the moment you know i was like whipping breakfast down walking around the paddock looking at everybody else right you know crapping themselves really right and and i'm just taking profit from it and i do genuinely think that i already had the head start on them before we even <coughs> set off in the event you know and what so what was it was that psychological kind of win you know like mastery if you like that you that you that you recognized and yeah. you're enjoying you yeah were like, i think so I think so, and it that was only from my side, you know what I mean? That's just, yeah. I didn't make myself enjoy it or anything like that. I just, I did absolutely love, you know, the, the build-up of pressure before you set off, and you had your routine, and I always had the same thing, you know, for breakfast, and I had my drinks, and I, and I had everything that I wanted. Then I'd have, you know, a bit of fruit, and then I'd have this, then we'd go to practice, then we'd come back, the mechanic would sort that. Everything was like a massive plan, and everybody yeah. knew what they were doing. But that moment getting to the event, that's, that's you know, what I sort of created, you know yeah. what I mean? As, yeah, yeah. as my dad sort of named them, you know, I've never had a head doctor or anything like that. Yeah, you know, yeah. I've never had any sort of specialists in, you know, in that sort of event preparation and never really believed in it, to be honest. Right. But you had, of, you had your rituals, though. You I, had had, your, I had my own plan. You had your and, stuff yeah. that you did that you yeah. knew would get you in that, in that Absolutely, like, yeah. mind space that you needed to be For in. For sure. And that's... Yeah, I mean, how do you replace that? Yeah, no, there isn't anything for that. There is for a lot of other things, obviously, yeah. personal. I say, you know, everything's absolutely wonderful. Couldn't be better, you know. Maybe family. you should take up triathlons. Triathlon? <laughs> oh, no, I've never run in my life. Well, you know what I mean, though? It's like the classic sort of, like, middle-aged, oh, like, no. oh, I'm going oh, to I'm gonna no, just no, start no, a new no, sport, no. you know? Oh, <laughs> my blooming legs are hurting thinking about yeah. it. No, triathlon? I can't, I can't see it. Oh, my God. I can't see it. bloody chance. I can't run to the end of the street. <laughs> I blame my ankles. Bad ankles. Yeah. But that must be a difficult one to, like, you can't replace that. No, there is no replacement of that. And I know there isn't. Um, and actually, I'm maybe quite happy that there isn't because... Right. You know, it's one of those unique things. You know, people take all sorts of substances and do all sorts of things. Well, I know that there isn't anything better than that. Yeah. That's good enough for me. So yeah. I've experienced it, you know, as and good you as had it a, gets. you had a good run. I had a hell of a good run. Yeah. I still get it a few times now in these classic events. You know, yeah. Scottish Six Dave, I've have six mornings of it. And I sort of, it's ridiculous to say, but I like look forward to getting up to, to that moment again. Yeah. Because now I can appreciate how special that moment is. After, yeah. When you're in the zone and all them years where you're winning and competing, you don't ever think about, you know, oh, that's a special moment. You just, you're rolling with it. But when you think back and do, you know, sort of interviews like this, they're, they're the bits that stick out. Yeah. That and preparation time was 
that was my time and that's the normal one that people just want to avoid but I managed to turn that being nervous into a, like a positive side and genuinely felt I had the advantage before we set off so did that mean more than the podium moments um looking back probably at the time definitely not um but looking back yeah yeah I think I'd rather when you look at it now I'd rather experience that a few more times than a few more podiums right which sounds completely the wrong way around but just interesting but if I, I probably couldn't choose because like I said I'm a bit greedy that way and yeah I'd, pro- I'd probably want another win and sacrifice that feeling for another win well you had both didn't you for a long time I did have for a long time yeah yeah so uh, but it's never enough you never had it? to choose because you never had to choose they were hand in hand it's yeah. never enough as I keep saying which is yeah well it's a bit of a problem from that side even yeah. though I've, I've surpassed way more than what I could have ever dreamed of right um in my career so you've learned not to try and replace that just to kind of like accept it yeah do that that's that's in that life yeah yeah yeah, yeah. That's, the, in the, the other, that's, that's the other dougie. that's in the other dougie's that's life that's the other dougie yeah yeah <laughs> yeah well i i, I kind of need to ask you about your dad i think yeah because this will be short what, what what we're talking about here is is massive highs and lows really yeah. aren't we throughout your career yeah and you know and obviously your dad was this integral part of your career and you and you, you lost your dad a couple yeah. of years ago and um yeah i'm interested in how you've how you've managed to cope with that really because yeah it, it's 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 first of all it's like the hardest thing ever to talk about i can talk about rubbish all day but you know we are a very very um close family all of the family not just me and my dad like I said, I've spent so many years with my dad as him being the mind of coming to every single event with me. You know, we had an, an amazing father and son relationship, but also we were a team. Yeah. You know, we were there to do a job. Yeah. Um, and he shared it with you. And and absolutely. And he had as much passion for it as I did, um, which was brilliant because when he finished riding, he finished riding. Like I said, he didn't didn't want to ride down the street. He didn't want to ride with his friends on the yeah. weekend. He just he just stopped. He he started again coming to events because I wanted to go. Um, obviously I went through all that success when we were in complete control and then when he got ill obviously we weren't in control yeah. and that's that's the, the like the tough part really because we've always managed to find a solution or a way around something you know we've yeah. always had what we wanted in a bit of a bit of a big headed way really well, no, if, you, had, you, know, you, if, know, you knew you could take action to change it yes yeah that's probably Whereas, it, isn't it yeah when when he was diagnosed with cancer we had we had absolutely you can't change it no control you know as as you know we're with specialists at, at christie's in manchester and and like you know they said you know afterwards you, we're sort of always chasing this job we're never on top of it well yeah. we always seem to be on top of everything what we were doing yeah so we're sort of following him so is that that must have been a com- obviously you've got the grief of losing your dad and knowing you were going to lose your dad but then you've got that psychological thing to to understand as well because that must have been a new thing for you yeah absolutely and through the period you know we were all so positive dad was so positive even though he was very poorly we were we were sort of we'd always been positive we'd always yeah. found a way around it you know you're not we're not really thought about it not happening you know right. I, I went off on holiday with my family and dad was just going to start another chemo chemo treatment um and then you know, he got some more tests back and I flew straight home and he right. decided not to take any more treatment. And that was like hitting a brick wall. It yeah. was like, hang on a minute. Right, this is actually happening. Well, we're not giving in, are we? Yeah. We've never given in, any of us. Yeah. But, you know, he'd come to a point where he just didn't want any more. Yeah. And I think that's, it's it's one of the, the, the trickiest things about that situation, isn't it? Because ultimately, in that, it, it can be fine to do that. Because if you can't win... And if it and if at that point some dignity so if it's, sort of speak. if it's that if at that point it's just about him being comfortable and accepting what's going to happen that's that's fine as well isn't it but that isn't kind of the way we sort of treat it is it no really? no know, no you, you and, it, and it's certainly told, not been sort of our sort of mentality it no, wasn't really our ethic but that's that's what I'm getting at he suffered enough yeah you know it's like that for three weeks he wanted to know where his off button was yeah you know just turn me off yeah you know, I'm I'm done yeah which. To, to hear them things in our families like I think in any families like what yeah, no yeah. but you can do this well that's not what we say you no know. yeah you can't it doesn't sort of sit right really <laughs> no and obviously left a absolutely massive hole yeah I'm sure you know culturally we kind of taught we can beat this and you know we can we got to keep fighting and the reality is different though isn't it yeah absolutely the, the rea- but in, in that in that situation I or we 
I'd never experienced that. So, no. you know, looking back, it was like a double hit, but yeah, he'd made that decision. Yeah. And, and obviously it wasn't his first decision, that is for sure. No, of course. Yeah. Um, and this also coincided with this <coughs> ridiculous wheelie project <laughs> that, oh, you, bloody hell. that you did. But yeah. it was kind of going on a similar time, right? So. Yeah, that's for sure. I mean, we'd kicked around with the uh, with the ideas because, like I said, I've been with Red Bull forever, um, longest standing athlete in the UK by really? about six or seven years. Yeah, yeah, I've I got no one that. close. Yeah, yeah. just yeah, need we... to sign another fifteen years. That's why they were all bowing when we came right. in here. Yeah, red carpet's on the street. We're we not seeing it. They bring it in now. They were like, "Oh, you hit see Dougie." Yeah, oh, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Get caval- <laughs> cavalcade in and everything. Yeah. Um, Get your own fridge. I've got my own fridge. Yeah. It's, it's bigger than the bosses as well. <laughs> in the boss's office, and I've got a bigger fridge than the boss. It's time served, is that? Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I've been with Red Bull for 20 years, and you're always encouraged to get these um, ideas, photos, videos, and I've certainly capitalised on that. I've ridden absolutely everywhere from ICE to Red Hot in QA, India, Sri Lanka, Maldives, you know, north of Finland. I've been everywhere. Um Uh, and a lot more in Europe and I was just thinking about something new and thinking what people could relate to Um, you know trials isn't the biggest sport and I just remember when you had a push bike or a motorbike when you were a kid you just wanted to jump it or wheelie it and there ain't a bloody chance I'm doing any jumping of anything ever so uh, that was out of the question so it was wheeling and our bike's not great for wheeling there's no seat it only does like 50 60 mile an hour absolutely flat out so it's not sort of your first choice, but I didn't really think of that. And we were all chatting around the table and we had all sorts of ideas floating about and I'd thrown a few ideas in and started talking about a couple of nice circuits where that might be nice or, you know, some nice streets somewhere that could be cool and look good on the video. And then it came round to like Isle of Man TT course and I'd lived there for 10 years and knew a lot about the place and, you know, somebody had tried it back in the day. Um, Dave Taylor had tried it three times and 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 not managed it i didn't realize that so yeah no a man called dave taylor tried it three times back in the day um we contacted the family actually right unfortunately he'd passed away also with right with cancer but his uh his children came actually to the event yeah and they were really pleased that was sort of carrying on the father's dream but as they said at the time it you know it was different then back in the day i mean he was doing 70 mile an hour in some places I wow. mean, it must have been absolutely ridiculous i mean take right. your hat off to the bloke yeah, amazing yeah. but you know it was never about a competition between me and him and me doing no, it which is why in the documentary that we did afterwards yeah. you know his son actually said you know my father never mentioned my father never won never managed to do it should i say yeah sure yeah. um it's great that dougie has that got taken out of the right because it wasn't about did he or didn't he yeah. or he did first or something like he had the idea he had the dream and to yeah. be fair a few things on his bike i copied where he was stood the front wheel spinning yeah had a great reference brilliant for me but yeah all of a sudden we we're wheeling the tt course and i was absolutely <laughs> oh my god what the <laughs> bloody hell are we doing i remember going home on the train i got i got to see my dad and uh went home and i said oh yeah next project wheeling tt course and he went you bloody idiot and I'm like all jumping about and he's like, you can't wheel it to the end of my drive. <laughs> the problem was he was absolutely right. I couldn't wheel it to the end of his drive. Right. It's like, what the hell are you doing? That's really funny because again, you kind of think it, that's not what you how it came across. And, and you know what I mean? You kind of yeah. think when someone like yourself takes on something like, yeah, I'm going to smash this. Yeah. But by the sounds of it, you were like, Oh, I hadn't what convinced him. I hadn't convinced him. I hadn't really convinced myself, but he definitely nailed the coffin on top of that. That right. was for sure. Yeah, so he wasn't there going like, yeah, you can have this, isn't No, it? and that was sort of like end of January when the, the full go-ahead, it had been sort of thrown around for like 18 months or so, maybe even a bit longer. Yeah. And end of January is when it all hit. And then Dad was poorly and we had a lot going on and I sort of cancelled a few things. And, and then Dad passed away early um, April. Right. I rode in the Scottish six days a few weeks later because my mum made me because obviously that is what he wanted to, to do at the moment. In yeah. that moment, I didn't want to do anything. Um, and I won, which was even better. Yeah. I don't know how I managed to do it. But you did. But I did. And um, then I went to do a video in, in India, which was already booked, which Red Bull were going to cancel. But I just said, no, I'm going to go because that's the plan. Yeah. This is what we're doing. Yeah. Um, and then all of a sudden it was like beginning of June and, and I was wheeling 1.2 miles from my record and I'm thinking, hang on a minute, we're a mile <laughs> off. So I just phoned up my manager 
who, like I said, has been with me for 20 odd years and yeah. said, well, I'm going to have to get out of this. I can't do it pretty casually, actually. And he didn't, right. he didn't say much on the phone. Um, <laughs> and then Turning white. I got a call from Blackie, <laughs> who'd been helping me do the bike. Uh, right. And he had an accident back in 93. He's been in a wheelchair since then. He's an engineer. Right. And he made all the parts for the bike and everything. And he said, Jake's been on. Uh, we're going to have to do a bit more practice. And I was like, no, nah, I'm out. I can't do it. I right. Just didn't didn't really have the head for it and then right. we had a bit of a we had a bit of a team meeting which obviously i didn't know that much about but yeah. it turned into a let's say a bit of a gathering of uh, an intervention you're not bloody getting <laughs> out of this red bull that was excuse why red bull's too far in which yeah. on hindsight were a load of rubbish really because right. if i said i'm not going then i wouldn't have been going but yeah but it sounds like that's not you though no and looking back they know me well enough to sort of make that happen as well including you know my wife and my cousin were there and yeah, I just like literally dropped tools and, and got stuck into to right. riding and did, doing everything. Did the work? Just over a thousand miles of training. Wow. That's a lot of wheeling at 5.30 <laughs> in the morning, so the police don't see you. Where were you doing that then? Um, around the little roads at home. Right. So it passed, there's a really quiet road um, if you go early enough and just passing a few farms. Right. Farmers used to wave at I was going to say, they must have been Thankfully, like, there there were no, yeah, they did do. <laughs> I got brought home in a there, cattle trailer once because they were on the way is, to the auction when I had a breakdown. <laughs> yeah, there he is again. Um, but that's what I was doing. I put the effort in. Right. Um, I think when we set off, it was really, really 50-50. Right. Uh, we were on the Isle of Man. We were cancelled the day for the wind. The whole team was there. We had a studio in the trucks. We had great presenters. Everything, it was massive. We had a helicopter for filming overhead. And they wanted me up on the line about 10 or 15 minutes before the start. And I was like, absolutely no chance. I'm not going to sit up there. There were people lining you right. know, the, the start-finish area. Did you have that same feeling? that you describe uh, no I think I would have shitting myself at that point <laughs> the only thing I might have just gone a bit too far here so you didn't have this like I'm going to smash this like uh, absolutely not right. so I pulled up onto the start line uh, my cousin James who's been with me you know pretty much all my career was sort of dry my boots and he just as he got it looked up he said we can do this right and then I looked across at the camera truck which was just in front of me and you know, like 10 metres in front of me which obviously that's what I was following the the whole way that was like a rolling roadblock the whole way yeah and jake was on there and i could see i just looked up at him and i just saw oh bloody hell fire and consequently as jake mentions afterwards and um, when we speak about this he said i must admit when i looked up at it i just <laughs> thought yeah we've absolutely blown his career here really yeah wow we've, we've shot stakes ourselves that, in stakes that high stakes were that high yeah right it was just the drama of it, I think, yeah. you know, the no television crew, so many people on yeah. site. I mean, you could just imagine the cost being absolutely ridiculous. And you know, we're just looking at one bloke riding around it. There's nowhere to hide. Yeah. Just me wheeling around, <laughs> choppers above. <laughs> and I just set off wheeling. And like Jake said, he didn't take a breath of air for the first three miles. It right. was unbelievable. And uh, yeah, it was all going okay. And then I went onto the mountain. It was quite windy still. And I nearly lost it a couple of times. Right. I was going a bit faster than what I wanted to do, using the brakes a bit more than I wanted. It's very downhill after that as you drop down off the mountain, so I need to back off a little bit. Yeah. Started off the week when I was doing a bit of practicing that I wanted in ears so I could hear some information of what was going on. I'd ripped all that out. That right. I didn't want anything. I was right. taking a bit of signal and some shouting from Jake, uh, which was good because there was a bus in the way in one place that the, the camera vehicles had to take to the pavements right. and stuff like that. Right, and right outriders were stopping people you know that were just didn't know what were going on yeah. basically so right. yeah coming down to the last bit and it finishes with the tightest two corners going around governor's bridge to before you go on to the start finish straight so it was never going to be over until i'd sort of got clear from there and so you didn't feel it wasn't like you started you got no no i went down a couple of gears to go into these corners absolutely yeah. clue, cruise these gears and it's really weird because my backside and my legs were sort of pulsating they were just about cramp solid right um i was in agony um the wind had sort of really taken its toll on me i was dragging across to one side and weaving a bit because i tried to just get a bit of blood flow it seemed like back into my legs and when i came out i never clicked up a gear right i just rode in third gear the whole way to finish so <laughs> camera vehicles you can see it disappearing off and that's just me thinking there's no bloody way i'm missing a gear now yeah 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 so, this'll do yeah this'll do so yeah got it over the line dropped it and legs are just dragging along the floor absolutely knackered how long did it take one hour 38 minutes wow so yeah you put that up certainly there. the best daftest 
most under pressure um draining thing i've ever done which i'll never repeat ever to that well level. i don't know if you can repeat that can you it's well like... i tried to do but these miserable buggers at red bull wouldn't let me do it but <laughs> i wanted to go up everest really yeah because a japanese man did it on a trials bike to about twenty one thousand feet back in I, the I, 80s i did i did i do remember it's one of the things you read that isn't it yeah what do you know what route he did no idea right we didn't get that far right and it, you wanted it, to do it i wanted to have a go right and they said no uh, not just that quickly. Yeah. No, we did a lot of looking into yeah, it, yeah. but it was something that was very difficult to work out. You know, there's I a lot mean, of bad publicity of the area at yeah. the moment I've, and I've, stuff like that. I've been that. to base camp and the, the idea of after that, try to do that. Yeah, I think there's a limit to what can you can do. But yeah, yeah no, that was on the tick list. And, um, right. Um, so you've yeah. got a few more like... Pretty, I just keep thinking that's pretty, the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Always thinking. Is there any more challenges like that that... that um, not really that spring to mind you know it's not something that I'm desperately wanting to do I, no. do, I do have you know other if, sort of projects saying I'm going to India to do another video and things yeah. like that which is amazing because they've got no idea what we do right. no idea of our sport and you know you get such an amazing welcoming reception yeah, that right. it's it's just really enjoyable Yeah, and we know we make a nice video and and get nice um, publicity out of it. But more than that, I'll get, you know, that that feeling again, you know, of people cheering and you know, yeah. stuff like that. And you've been the focus again. And, yeah. and, and you know, and that's, you know, another bite of that. Yeah. That, 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 those memories, really. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think we better give it one more because we've done an hour. It's gone <laughs> pretty bloody quick. And also... I think, Is that an hour? Yeah. And thought also, I needed a wee. <laughs> Yeah, me too. Those them forty-year-old bladders. I guess the que- I'm going to give you a classic question. I ask a lot of people on this podcast, but make it an easy one. Especially people like that have achieved so much, like yourself. What What are you proudest of when you look back? I think it has to be world championships. Yeah, because that was always the the end game. That was always the ultimate. That there was nothing more than that. Yeah, but then that evolved and other opportunities came, you know, like I keep mentioning and keep saying, you know, Red Bull opened up a massive amount of opportunities without them and my manager, Jake, the TT wheelie would have never, ever happened. Yeah. That's right up there. Yeah. There's no question about it. That's right up there with the, with the world championship, that achievements, you know, people say, oh, well, you did this, you did that. No problem. You carry on. It's still there. Go and have a go. Yeah. Because I am not having another go. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Yeah. And I think from more from a personal side and probably from my, if you ask my parents this question, it'd be my MBE. Yeah. Well, it's massive. Um, because at the time I was like, someone's just been on the phone six weeks before Christmas. Someone's just been on the phone. They're sending me a letter. Apparently I've got an MBE or something. Right. And they're all going, yeah, you've got that wrong. And then this lovely letter comes through right. saying, you know, if you want it, you don't have to have it and all this carry on. And I'm away and my dad's opened my post and, and like he can hardly speak to me on the phone. He's like so emotional about it. And I put phone down going, what's up with that silly old bugger? I'm an MBE. Yeah. What's that? Old people get stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. You just didn't didn't take it in. Yeah. But, you know, I got recognised by our country for what I've done in my sport. Yeah. Which is, once again, for me, it's not just there in the World Championship. For my parents, it's definitely just above. Yeah. Well, I, you can, so that's three things, not one. Yeah. Sorry, no, that's, that's but that's great. probably on lucky side, is that, isn't it? Yeah, they, I mean, brilliant. Hey, Dougie, I really enjoyed that. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for doing it, mate. Cheers. So there you go. That was my conversation with Dougie. I hope you enjoyed it. Add it all that one, eh? What a life and what a perspective on life. Really like Dougie. He kicked things off by immediately calling me out on my accent as soon as we met. Uh, which I very much appreciate. It takes a northerner to uh, to get that gag. Uh, and we got on from there. Top man, top chat, and big thanks to his agent and manager, Jake, who I'm going to say is probably the most helpful person I've dealt with in the time I've been doing this show. No messing, straight back with answers to all my questions, and even sent over a helpful list of possible questions that were really, really helpful. I mean, it doesn't sound like much, but compared to some of the ridiculous lengths I have to go to to get even a response from some managers and certain athletes. Well, when grown-ups come along who are good at their job and good people with it, it stands out, believe me. So thanks, Jake. Really appreciated that. Okay, housekeeping corner. 
like I said at the beginning, regular listeners of the show might have noticed that I've had a few weeks off recently. The main reason for that is because I actually had a bit of shit news about Peg, my dog who I've mentioned on the show a few times and who occasionally pops up on my social media in finest podcast host trope fashion. Turns out poor old Peg has a condition that has seen him develop early onset arthritis, unfortunately, and which is going to necessitate some pretty full on treatment over the next year. He's only one, bless him. And uh, he's been just basically really unlucky. It took us about six weeks to get a full diagnosis. We ended up getting referred to the super vet, who's kind of a big deal over here in the UK and widely regarded as the best vet in the country. They have been completely amazing, have helped us get our heads around the whole thing as well as help us prepare for the couple of surgeries Peg's going to need to get him ready for his future life of being rad, legging it around the place, making us play tug of war with him. And uh, yeah, generally bezing it around with other dogs, which is definitely his favorite things to do. Basically, he's going to need our help to uh, ensure the full Peg radness can flourish. So that's what we're going to do. Got a pretty tough year ahead, I think. Um turns out it's quite common this thing it's like everything you know as soon as i mention it to people they go oh i know somebody whose dog had that um yeah it's been a bit of a preoccupation for most of june that which is why i was pretty off radar not really that um on top of the podcast thing as much as i've been previously life comes at you pretty fast as a great man once said um but yeah you know got made around it peg's doing great i mean he's fucking don't give a shit he's just flying around the place as usual um so yeah i'll keep you posted i'm sure he'll he'll be popping up on my social every now and again as as he has done in the past also got a letter from listener beto beto sorry sorry man you've been a long time supporter of the show i totally see that and i appreciate it anyway he wrote in response to my musings at the end of my episode with Elias elhart when i was wondering if it's time to get all uh you know rich roll on the case just wanted to share my perspective on your comments and questions at the end of the Elias podcast. I really don't think you should do the video YouTube, big production, long interview type of stuff. I much prefer the way your show runs now, which is super authentic and natural, e.g. Brian Gucci's interview by the river or this amazing conversation you just had with Elias. I mean, ultimately, it's up to you, but I just wanted to share my perspective. I had a lot of people, well, you know, a few get in touch about that. Pretty much all of them said don't do the whack big video thing, um, which was interesting, really, because, uh, you know, I was kind of expecting a few people to be into it. I'm reliably informed that a lot of people consume their podcasts via the medium of YouTube. I don't, but then I am an old man. Um, but, you know, I'll keep thinking about it. I'd have to clone myself if I was going to try and do it now, but you never know. So thanks to everyone who got back in touch about that. That was pretty helpful. Uh, also had a trip to Munich for the for ISPO Outdoor Trade Show, which saw me join the rest of my wonderful industry buddies at a trade show in the middle of Munich in 30 degree heat, which was a mixed experience, I'm going to say. Anyway, I'm back. I'm gearing up for a summer of banging out a few more of these podcasts. As ever, if you enjoyed the show, please do let me know by emailing me at podcast at wearelookingsideways.com. You can message me over at Instagram at We Look Sideways, where there's a bit of an ongoing dialogue going on with listeners via the medium of Instagram stories, which is quite a laugh. If you did enjoy the show, please consider sharing it on social media, leaving me a review on Apple Podcasts, maybe even buying some motherfucking merchandise, which a few of you have uh, steadfastly been doing, and it's very much appreciated. Uh, and if you do enjoy the show, Maybe you want to sign up for my newsletter, which goes out every Sunday a.m. from here in the UK. Five things that I think are worth sharing each week, which many thousands of people are currently enjoying. Um, and, you know, a few people and subscribing, but that's, as I've said before, a masochistic highlight of the week, seeing who's unsubscribed, especially when it's a mate. I can see you. I know you're doing it. Anyway, you can find the sign-up form over at www.wearelookingsideways.com. All right, I'll be back soon with another episode. In the meantime, have a good one. Nice one.